Carlos, should we should we begin? Yes, let's uh, go ahead. All right. Uh, welcome to uh, Cardiac Grand Rounds, everyone. Uh, I hope uh, I hope the nice weather will uh, will will uh, persist throughout the week. Uh, we have uh, a very interesting day today in the in the United States, and we have a uh, a very distinguished. Uh, uh, lecturer uh, this morning who's agreed to uh, talk to us about uh, heart failure. Um, he's uh, I've known him for some time, uh, primarily in, uh, through uh, involvement in uh, in clinical trials as well as uh, through activities in the Heart Failure Society, who, in which Dr. Butler has been very active. Um, his uh, course uh, throughout his training and uh, and uh, practice have been uh, littered along the. Uh, 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 the uh, influential universities you know, began in uh, the Aga Khan University. Uh, he's uh, completed residencies in cardiac, uh, uh, cardiac uh, or cardiology and advanced heart failure at Yale, uh, imaging at the Mass General and Harvard Medical School, and public health at Harvard uh, as and Emory University. Uh, he has, has been um, a chief uh, and director of the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at Stony Brook. Uh, and uh, also before that at uh, Emory and, and Vanderbilt where he trained. And he's currently the uh, Patrick Lee and chair in cardiovascular research uh, and professor and chairman of the Department of Medicine uh, in the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson and, and professor of physiology. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Butler uh, who has a wealth of experience is, has uh, um, uh, and is, has been intimately involved in the executive committee of large influential heart failure trials uh, most recently, uh, but certainly not limited to uh, the Victoria trial and others. So we really look forward to hearing you, uh, Javed, uh, and uh, the rest of the time is yours. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you very much. I uh, really, really appreciate uh, the opportunity. Uh, uh, a, a, a less well-known fact is that uh, the university where I went from med school, Daga Khan University, has very deep ties with, uh, with Calgary uh, 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 at an official level. And uh, we used to come there as med students to do electives. Now, this is about 100 years ago. Uh, and I uh, would love the opportunity in the post-COVID world uh, that uh, uh, perhaps we could do these kind of things face to face again. But in the meantime, we'll try to make the best of it. Now, uh, uh, Jonathan uh, uh, suggested that I talk a little bit uh, uh, in generic terms and update on what we are learning from these clinical trials in general in the heart failure world and not necessarily focus on just, uh, just one trial uh, per se. So that's uh, precisely what I will do. Uh, but we can make it in incredibly informal, please stop me in the middle or at the end, I'll be happy to uh, <clears throat> answer any questions regarding the presentation that I'm making or uh, the ongoing trials or the things that might be coming in the future. Uh, these are my uh, uh, general sort of disclosures, uh, but, but the biggest disclosure I have uh, is that uh, I am uh, uh, going to be ad-libbing uh, ad a lot of uh, uh, editorial comments again, in the spirit of uh, uh, talking about the lessons learned as opposed to just showing results because we can all look at the result. Uh, so I will be giving a lot of sort of editorial comments uh, during my presentation. Uh, so uh, let's just start quickly with Arnie. Uh, this is sort of uh, uh, old news and, and, and it's absolutely great to be in the heart failure space. Uh, that a trial that comes out five years ago becomes old news because we have had so many uh, new news. So this is also actually relatively new news. Uh, uh, and the uptake continues, but, but relatively slowly. <clears throat> so uh, with Paradigm HF and then uh, Pioneer HF uh, sort of uh, came out and showed this uh, significant reduction in uh, heart failure readmission rate. Uh, so, so two pushbacks, uh, well, there were, there were three pushbacks that Paradigm HF got, and I honestly don't understand why there is so much pushback on these things. Uh, and my, my second last slide will sort of summarize why I don't understand why there is all this pushback, because I think the issue is really not data. The issue is uh, sort of the philosophical perspective with which we sort of look at life. So we'll, we'll leave the philosophy uh, towards the end of the, the presentation. So one pushback was uh, this whole issue of run-in phase, and in the run-in phase, are you sort of selecting a specific population? And then this Pioneer HF 
this whole notion that Pioneer HF had uh, a primary endpoint of NT pro BNP and that the heart failure hospitalization benefit was a secondary benefit that we cannot trust, uh, and it's uh, only about an 800 patient study. That would be a very valid interpretation if Pioneer HF came before Paradigm HF. Uh, in other words, you had no prior prior to Pioneer HF. Uh, so the question is, in the absence of a prior, how do you look at the posterior results when you do get the results? The issue here is that the Pioneer HF came after Paradigm HF. So you had an incredibly solid prior of an 8,000 patient study and, and if you are not a frequent test, but you're a Bayesian, uh, you incorporate that previous knowledge and bring it to here. So at least in my, so sort of my first editorial comment would be that you really got to have a tolerability insurance cost some reason uh, for the patients to not uh, leave the hospital on valsartan sacubitril if they come in with decompensated heart failure uh, based on uh, these results. And then the third sort of the pushback that Paradigm HF got uh, was that there is no data on cardiac remodeling. So how do we know it improves uh, a cardiac function? Uh, so that's sort of an interesting pushback, right? Because one, uh, we know that beta blockers and CRT in patients with half ref improve ejection fraction. We know that ACE inhibitors is stabilize the decline in ejection fraction, but they don't improve the ejection fraction a lot. And the delta difference at the end of the trials that we see with ACE inhibitors is because the placebo arm continues to get worse. And we also know that MRAs don't improve ejection fraction a whole lot. So what we know is that there are mechanisms beyond remodeling. So remodeling has a very good positive predictive value. If you remodel the heart, you're gonna live longer if you do it in a sustainable fashion. Uh, so in other words, not, not inotrope for two days and you have some in short-term increased contractility. We're talking about sustainable. But if you don't improve ejection fraction, the negative predictive value is actually pretty poor. You can still improve survival. So again, if somebody would show me data on improved contractility, but there's no data in, in, in survival, uh, we have been burned before by things like Vesnerinone that, that did that, uh, but not only did you not improve outcome, you actually worsened outcome. Uh, so that would not be enough. But again, if Paradigm HF and 8,000 patients, you've shown a 20% reduction in mortality, uh, why do we care about ejection fraction other than scientific curiosity. And scientific curiosity obviously is important. Nevertheless, I could not give a single talk about Paradigm HF where there was not this yearning to know what happens to the heart. Now, our, you know, some of us may not know the, the historical background as to why we don't have data on ejection fraction uh, with Vassard and Sucubitril. Remember that neprilysin inhibition was being uh, developed as an antihypertensive agent in the 1980s in Japan. Uh, and there was only one problem when we gave neprilysin inhibition to patients with hypertension, it did not lower blood pressure. So it's a problem if an antihypertensive drug don't lower blood pressure. And the reason for that now we understand very well uh, is that neprilysin is a pretty promiscuous enzyme. And when you give neprilysin inhibition, you not only stop the degradation of uh, the good base active peptides like ANP, BNP, CNP, but you also decrease the degradation of angiotensin II and by increasing angiotensin in two levels, you have uh, uh, some of the beneficial effect goes away. Uh, that led to the combination of ACE inhibitor with neprilysin inhibition, that with neprilysin inhibition, you're going to get all the good vasoactive peptides go up, uh, but you don't care about angiotensin two because you're giving ACE inhibitor. So that was the time where we did sort of the usual animal studies and, and, and early phase studies, except that with that drug, there was a higher incidence of angioedema then we lost another decade, and then we ended up getting uh, an ARB uh, with uh, uh, neprilysin inhibition. But because fundamentally we just for the sake of reducing side effects switched an ACE inhibitor to ARB, this is the only drug to my knowledge that went directly to a phase three trial and never had a phase two uh, uh, a study. So we have no remodeling data, we went directly to phase three. The problem is how do you find out improvement in ejection fraction with Entresto if 
the trial was stopped early by the Data Safety Monitoring Board, uh, got an early uh, uh, indication by the regulators, and has a class one indication. And in order to see remodeling, you have to give a non uh, entresto arm, either ACE inhibitor or placebo, uh, for six to 12 months, that no IRB would allow that. So how do you do that study? The bottom line is that we are caught in a position where we cannot do that study. So the only thing that you can do is a pre-post study, and that is what this is. 800 patient, when the clinical decision is made that you will be started on Entresto, you do a baseline echo and then follow the echo over time in six months to 12 months. And these results are as impressive as they can get in terms of improvement in ejection fraction of you know, almost getting close to 10% and decreases in volume uh, 12 to 15 uh, ml. So uh, how do you interpret these, these results? Uh, well, there are, there are two ways of interpreting these results. One can say, well, there is no placebo arm here. So these results are more impressive than they need to be because maybe the 9.4% ejection fraction, if you were to have a control arm, maybe the 9.4% will look like 5% because there will be some improvement in placebo. I would make exactly the opposite case that heart failure is a, a, a chronic worsening disease. And if we actually had a placebo, the placebo would have worsened by two or 3% and the net difference would be 12%. We can have an academic discussion, we will never know, but the bottom line is uh, that we have filled a lot of holes with RD, we have in-hospital data, we have reverse remodeling data, uh, and that really does remain foundational therapy. So that then brings us to the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, so one question with SGLT2 inhibitors uh, was sort of how do they work? Uh, uh, this will really take up really valuable time and I would really wanna talk some of the lessons learned in terms of the data and not go into the mechanism of action. So I will be happy to uh, uh, answer uh, any questions that, that we may have about mechanism of action. But the bottom line is, if you look at the effect on, on, on if you look at the effect on uh, uh, congestion, if you look at the effect on uh, uh, adiposity, on uh, uh, cardiac function, on autophagy, on ADP generation, on renal function, on sodium hydrogen exchange uh, inhibitor uh, inhibition. I mean, the, the, the issue that we really have with SGLT2 inhibitors is not how they improve cardiovascular outcome. The issue is what does any of this have to do with diabetes? And we really have, cardiovascular risk modifying agents uh, that tend to uh, also have glycemic benefit. Uh, and, and I'm glad that uh, uh, several of us uh, around the globe really persisted because uh, when the heart failure data initially came out with Empereg and uh, uh, Canvas and uh, Declare, uh, there was a desire to do heart failure studies, but the desire was to do the heart failure studies only in patients with diabetes. And it was really push, push, push uh, that we should just do the heart failure studies for heart failure sake and have nothing to do with diabetes. And I'm glad that we did uh, because of the way the, the heart failure data has turned out so far. And actually it has opened the door uh, for doing studies in, uh, in post-MI patients and mechanistic studies and CKD studies and acute heart failure studies that have actually nothing to do with diabetes. It's, these are all comer studies. Uh, I don't want to uh, uh, prematurely say too much, but I mean, we may have a statin situation or an ACE inhibitor situation at our hand that these are really cardiovascular risk modifying agents across a broad group of agents. So uh, there were five large heart failure studies that were started, uh, two with dapagliflozin and reduced and preserved ejection fraction, two with empagliflozin and reduced and preserved ejection fraction, and uh, uh, one with worsening heart failure with uh, uh, soda gliflozin. The soda gliflozin trial, unfortunately, was stopped early, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's enrolled over 1,000 patients, so we should be seeing some results from that, uh, but, but the study was never completed. The two heart failure with preserved ejection fraction studies are ongoing, and the two heart failure with reduced ejection fraction studies are the ones that I wanna talk about today. So the first one was dapagliflozin, in DAPA HF, a 4,700 patient uh, study uh, uh, followed the patients uh, longitudinally for the, uh, 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 not the traditional endpoint, sort of the expanded endpoint with the heart failure communities now expand, uh, accepting more and more. So the primary endpoint was cardiovascular death or 
car, uh, a heart failure hospitalization or outpatient worsening heart failure. So if you have heart failure, uh, uh, emergency room visit or IV diuretic in the outpatient were included in the primary endpoint. Uh, so this was sort of a, a crackerjack of a trial, really well conducted, uh, uh, no place to sort of poke any holes in this trial. Uh, but the biggest thing is that this was really the first trial uh, that had phenomenal baseline medical therapy. You know, we are sort of living in this phase of uh, uh, a polypharmacy and heart failure. So in order to justify an additional drug, you really need to make sure that the patients are on good baseline medical therapy. The bottom line is that near ubiquitous use of diuretics, of RAS inhibitors, of beta blockers, uh, and, and this was the first trial that showed MRA use of greater than 70%. Remember that MRA is likely never going to match ACE inhibitors and beta blockers uh, uh, because of the, the creatinine and uh, uh, potassium issues. So really well-treated group of uh, patients. So whatever we are seeing is on top of really good medical therapy, 26% uh, relative risk reduction, uh, number needed to treat of 21. The curve started separating early and continued to separate. Uh, one thing to notice, let's just look at the placebo event rate uh, at 12 months or one year event rate, about 14% or so uh, of the patients, so one in six uh, uh, had a uh, primary endpoint event within one year. So, uh, you know, how to interpret these data? Well, I mean, you know, uh, these were exclusively outpatient, were not enriched for sick patients, 70% were class two and unbelievably good baseline therapy. So if there is any patient population that should be regarded as stable heart failure, uh, this is the population. And, and even then, uh, it makes the case that there is no such thing as a stable heart failure. At one year, we are talking about 14, 15% event rate, uh, and uh, the curve started separating really early. Uh, we proved the hypothesis and really proved it in this trial uh, that this has nothing to do with diabetes, that these are all these other cardiovascular benefits that lead to uh, cumulative benefit in the patients. Uh, uh, the absolute risk was higher in type 2 diabetics, as we might expect, uh, but the relative risk reduction, I mean, these two curves are almost sort of interchangeable. The magnitude is uh, exactly the same between the two. Uh, and then both uh, the endpoints uh, uh, were met, uh, worse than heart failure, 30% relative risk reduction, cardiovascular death, uh, p-value of 0.029. Uh, it took about a year for the curve to separate, nothing happening, but one can expect that mortality will take a longer time uh, to show uh, benefit. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, 0.029 or 0.03 in terms of secondary analysis. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, let me hold on to some uh, uh, editorial comments uh, in comparison to uh, Emperor Reduce, uh, but just keep this image in mind that it took about a year or so for the curve to start separating uh, in this uh, trial. So that leads us to the second trial that came out, Emperor Reduce. Uh, this is the trial where uh, I was on the, uh, lucky enough to serve on the executive committee. Uh, so what were the differences between Emperor Reduce and uh, ADAPA HF? Well, one, obviously, it's testing a different SGLT2 inhibitor and pluglifosin, but fundamentally, uh, there were uh, sort of three differences between the two trials. So one is, uh, we went for a more traditional endpoint of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization and all of those other things, uh, like... Uh, 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 emergency room visit or outpatient IV diuretic use were secondary uh, exploratory endpoints. The second thing is that we really enriched the population for sicker population. We wanted to study a little bit sicker population. So uh, DAPA-HF uh, had the traditional uh, EGFR cutoff of 30. Uh, Emperor Reduce went down all the way to GFR of 20. So that was one way to enrich the population. And two, the NT-PRO BNP criteria were much higher in Emperor Reduce than, than DAPA HF. Uh, so uh, if you look at the populations, uh, the ejection fraction was about 3-4% lower in Emperor Reduce. Uh, NT-PRO BNP was about 4-500 picograms higher. GFR was about 5 uh, uh, mLs lower. Uh, RNE was about uh, double. So uh, Valsartan sucubitril use was about 10% in DAPA HF, was about 20% in Emperor Reduce, uh, and uh, was uh, uh, device use was, was higher as well. So clearly, uh, 
uh, by patient characteristic was a sicker population. Whether the outcome reflected that or not, I'll come to that in my next slide. So <clears throat> these are uh, the primary uh, endpoint results. So there, the, the emperor reviews only had three endpoints which were pre-specified in a hierarchical matter. So everything else was an exploratory analysis. The first was the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. If that endpoint was met, then the next endpoint was all heart failure hospitalization. And if that endpoint was met, then the preservation of renal function, everything else was, was exploratory endpoint. So this is the primary endpoint. So before we look at the primary endpoint, let's look at the one-year uh, event rate in this trial, and it was about 20%. Uh, so, so the placebo event rate was about 40% higher uh, than DAPA-HF, which was about 14, 15, 16%. Here is about 20, 21%. Uh, so clearly a sicker population. The primary endpoint relative risk reduction is absolutely identical between the two trials, 25% relative risk reduction. Absolute risk reduction, 5.2% was higher and number needed to treat of 19 was lower, but that's not because the, the drug is better or the trial is better, it's because we had sicker population. And absolute risk reduction and number needed to treat is related to uh, your baseline level of sick population. So pretty identical results between the two trials. So because we met our first endpoint, we then move on to the second endpoint, which was uh, all heart failure hospitalization first and recurrent. And that is shown here, 30% relative risk reduction, really impressive results. So that leads us to our third endpoint, and which is the renal endpoint. So if you were to ask me what excites me the most about uh, Emperor Reduce, that uh, is this and the next slide. The, these two slides are the most exciting things for me, which are the renal endpoints. So uh, a few uh, uh, non-scientific subjective comments where, where if you can just put your eye of faith in it, uh, and, and I, I've highlighted, these are non-scientific comments. So one is, that we know that ACE inhibitors uh, reduced uh, GFR because of intraglomerular uh, hemodynamic changes by ca causing efferent dilatation. Uh, and you stop ACE inhibitor and that GFR comes back. So when we see a creatinine bump and we start ACE inhibitors, that is not glomerulopathy or tubular damage, that is just intralunar hemodynamic changes. Uh, in the long run, these drugs are uh, renal preserving drugs. So it's exactly the same with SGLT2 inhibitors. So if you look at the left, graph on the left, uh, one can see when we start empagliflozin, there's a drop in GFR. We have seen that with all SGLT2 inhibitors. But here comes sort of the eye of faith. And the eye of faith is that if you just look at this slide, you would say, well, the renal function starts sort of stabilizing at about 12 weeks or so. Uh, and then the curve separate between EMPA and placebo at about uh, well, a year and a half. But remember, when we stopped the trial, we were able to get uh, uh, GFRs on about 800 patients. So if you took at the right end of the curve, uh, in about a month, when we stopped placebo, nothing happened. But when we stopped empagliflozin, we got 3.3 mLs of GFR back. So I completely understand, you know, these are not the same patients, selection bias. But if you were to just put eye of faith and just extrapolate that 3.3 mL right back to the initiation, like, like deduct uh, that, that hemodynamic reduction in GFR, one can see stabilization right from the beginning. So that's one subject to come. And the second is that remember placebo, we are using the word placebo glibly here. Uh, the baseline medical therapy in Emperor uh, Reduce was the same as DAPA-HF. Near ubiquitous use of uh, diuretics, of RAS inhibitors, of beta blockers, and 70 plus percent MRA use. And now we also have the Fidelio uh, CKD results out uh, showing that finerenone or MRA in CKD improve outcomes. So here, placebo basically means over 90% of RAS inhibitor use and over 70% of MRA use. And despite of that protection in this high-risk group, there's a linear decline in the placebo arm in renal function. So what does that uh, translate into? Well, here it is what it translates into, that uh, with that uh, RAS inhibitor and MRA background, uh, there's a 2.3 ml per minute per year decline in GFR, which was stabilized to 0.5 ml per minute per year with empagliflozin for a net difference of 1.73 ml per minute per year. Uh, this is, is just absolutely huge. Uh, whether or not in the future all of these things become 
regulatory acceptable for drug approval and, and how does that shape in the future of renal trials will be very interesting. Uh, but as a researcher, uh, this is the most exciting thing, uh, 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 at least uh, uh, for me, uh, in the trial. Uh, however, uh, when I wear my clinician hat and I'm seeing the patients in the clinic, uh, they are not impressed by EGFR slopes. They want to know what actually happened to the patients. So if you look at the renal composite, uh, whether somebody needed uh, uh, dialysis, uh, renal transplantation, uh, renal death, uh, a sustained reduction in GFR, the renal composite uh, was slashed in half. There was a 50% relative risk reduction uh, with the use of empagliflozin uh, in this trial. Uh, so basically the trial was designed to reach all of these three endpoints. Uh, all of them were met highly statistically significantly uh, and uh, were uh, 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 clinically uh, very relevant as well. Now our patients also want to feel better uh, so in the interest of time, I won't go over uh, a lot of the responder analysis, but we'll be happy to answer questions uh, that you may have. But the bottom line is that all domains of KCCQ, the clinical summary score, uh, the total summary score, so total summary score is symptoms, clinical summary score is symptoms and physical limitation, and overall summary score or OSS is symptoms, physical limitation, and then social limitations and quality of life. So everything combined. All of these things were improved the first time we measured at three months and were sustained the last time we measured at nine months. So uh, very robust results. And the responder analysis for five and 10 point benefit was in favor of amplagliflozin and five point deterioration was uh, seen with uh, uh, placebo. Okay, so that brings us uh, to some of the subgroup uh, uh, analysis. So the first uh, one is the diabetes. Uh, so we have proven once and for all uh, that these uh, uh, drugs have nothing to do with uh, uh, diabetes. Uh, as you can see, uh, in both trials, we're seeing consistent benefit. This is from a meta-analysis that came out in Lancet that we published, combining the results of DAPA, HF, and Ember reduced. Uh, so uh, consistent benefit, uh, both in terms of direction and magnitude. So the other issue is, is, is RD. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, some individuals have, and, and this is the same as, as uh, renal also, and I'll come to that in the next slide. So in some of the uh, meetings, uh, 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 some people have sort of said that, well, you know, you get a benefit uh, with uh, dapagliflozin uh, if you're not on an RNE, but look, you don't get any benefit if you are on RNE. Uh, there is not a statistically significant benefit. I mean, I would say that this is absolutely the wrong interpretation. I think both trials are showing consistent benefit. These are independent pathways, non-overlapping independent pathways. It's like saying, you know, certain cardiac death risk is reduced by beta blockers and defibrillators, but just because you have a beta blocker doesn't mean you don't need a defibrillator. If you have a defibrillator, it doesn't mean you don't need a beta blocker. You really need both. Uh, the only difference between Emperor Reduce and DAPA HF is that Emperor Reduce had more power. We had more patients. Uh, we had almost 200 more patients on ARNI, and therefore we achieved statistical significance even in the ARNI group that we did not find any statistical heterogeneity between the two. And the uh, DAPA-HF crossing one is only a matter of power and not a matter of consistency of results. So that brings me to the other two results, renal and cardiovascular death. So let me just opine a little bit on these and, and again, a lot of sort of subjective comments. So. If you look at DAPA, HF, and Emperor reduced, the cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization, uh, no difference, first heart failure hospitalization, no difference, identical results. Uh, so that brings us to the third endpoint, renal endpoint. So DAPA, HF did not achieve statistically significant renal endpoint, and Emperor reduced, as I said, there was uh, almost a 50% reduction, uh, which was highly statistically significant. So how do you interpret that? Should we say that DAPA, HF, Emperor Reduce was a, a, a more positive trial because there's a, a renal benefit in DAPA HF. Uh, there's no renal benefit. And the answer is, of course, not. Uh, partly, of course, not because now we have a full renal trial called DAPA CKD out. Uh, but even suppose if we did not have DAPA CKD at the end of the day, if you not just look at sort of one trial, but look at the totality of evidence of renal benefit we are seeing with SGLT2 inhibitors and in all uh, diabetes CVOT and the fact that the renal endpoint and DAPA-HF had a different definition and they had fewer events than Emperor reduced, 
this result to me is exactly the same as the army result I showed. It's a matter of power. Uh, and when we did the meta-analysis, we did not find any statistical heterogeneity at all. So that brings me to the cardiovascular death. Now here, the results are opposite. There is statistical benefit in DAPA HF, 18% risk reduction, and in emperor reviews, uh, there was an 8% reduction and there was not a statistically significant result. So how do you interpret these results? So, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of interesting. You do, do these trials and, you know, when, when you're designing the trial, uh, you use your best judgment, uh, but you can only do the experiment one, and then and then you sort of learn the lessons, and sometimes you learn good lessons, and sometimes you sort of learn not good lessons. And, and I would say this is one place where sort of I learned the not good lesson. So uh, we went for a high, so, so multiple ways of interpreting these results, right? So one way to interpret these results uh, uh, is to look at it from a statistical perspective, and that's what we did in our meta-analysis in Lancet. And basically, uh, we did not find a, a statistical heterogeneity. If you look at the patient population in the context of the trial, and the you know the the meta-analysis conclusion was that there was a modest 15% or so reduction in mortality with these trials, and one trial got on the right side of it, and one trial got on the wrong side of it. I, I really think that the lessons learned here are much more than that sort of the statistical uh, uh, high level results that I showed you. Uh, so what is interesting is uh, that we went for a higher risk population for two reasons. One, uh, we wanted to increase the evidence base beyond what we, we were going to learn from DAPA-HF. Uh, DAPA-HF started a little bit earlier than ever reduced. Uh, so you wanted to go for a broader population and two, uh, uh, you want to know what happens in the sicker patient population. Now, that one decision kind of came back to, to bite us a little bit because theoretically, you know, when, when I sort of discussed this on rounds with, uh, with the residents and fellows, and sort of I asked them the question, if you enroll sicker patients in a trial, will you have more or less patients die in a trial? And it's not a trick question. The answer is more patients who are sick are going to die. And I already showed you that our Kaplan-Meier curve at one year had higher event rate. However, that is not what happened in the trial. We had less patients die in the trial. So why is, why is it that you take sicker patients and have less deaths in the trial? Well, there are three reasons for that. One, Simple math, we, have, we had a smaller trial. DAPA-HF was 4,700 patients, emperor reduce was 3,700 patients, so we had fewer patients in the trial. That's not the issue. The issue is that we had a shorter trial. So on average, the DAPA-HF trial follow-up was 18.2 months and emperor reduce was 16 months. So some of us may say, well, you know, two months, I mean, is it really a big deal for two months difference in the follow-up? But when you do a 3,700 patients times two months, 7,000 months times, I don't know, 20 years or whatever, total trial less follow-up. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is that remember, these are not cardiovascular death, nor time-driven trial, these are primary endpoint event driven trials. In other words, we do not do trials, and, and that's the biggest lesson, and that's the, the sort of a viewpoint that I'm writing right now, uh, is to say that fundamentally we should do trials differently in heart failure going forward based on all the lessons that we have learned. And by the way, everything that I'm saying right now will be totally relevant to the next trial that I want to discuss, which is uh, Victoria. So. Uh, we don't say that we're going to do a trial where everybody will be followed for five years. We don't say that we are going to do the, every trial uh, where we have a conclusive evidence whether the trial uh, reduces cardiovascular mortality or not. No, no, that's not what we say. We say that the primary endpoint is cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization, uh, and in case of DAPA-HF, uh, outpatient visits or ER visit. Uh, and both trials almost had the same number of primary endpoint events that were needed uh, to uh, close the trial, which was near about 800 or so. Well, ironically speaking, if you take a lesser sick population like DAPA-HF, when you are waiting for 800 events to accrue, more patients die because less sick patients don't get hospitalized as frequently and you have certain cardiac death and other things happen. When you take a really sick patient, 
you have boom, 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 people keep getting hospitalized. So you hit your 800 patient mark earlier than you would otherwise. The problem is that you had earlier, not because of mortality, because you never did the trial long enough to accrue mortality, is because you just accrue all heart failure hospitalizations. So the ratio of cardiovascular death to heart failure hospitalization in DAPA-HF was almost one is to one. Whereas in Emperor reduced it was two is to one. There were twice as number of heart failure hospitalizations at, as mortality. So ironically, in a sicker patient population, we had fewer mortality events and we had less power. We had about 110 less mortality events than we had uh, in Emperor Reduce. So I really appreciate sort of giving grand rounds and, and being able to sort of have an academic discussion as opposed to sort of a regulatory discussions where you're sort of limited in what you can say. But these are the subtleties and nuances across the trials. Uh, and then the, another reason where there may be less cardiovascular mortality is because there was more use of defibrillators and RNA. So that, that argument that also has been made. Uh, what I'm really glad uh, is that, you know, uh, the Emperor Reviews uh, investigators have written two viewpoints, uh, one in the European Heart Journal and the European Journal of Heart Failure, uh, that have tried to make that point, but, but we are obviously biased because we did Emperor Reduce trials. Uh, but, but what I'm really happy is that the DAPA-HF investigators have written two viewpoints, one in circulation and one in the European Journal of Heart Failure, also saying exactly the same thing that there's really no army, no renal, no mortality difference between the two trials, uh, and that these two trials are giving us the, the, the same uh, interpretation. So that's at least sort of the lessons learned. And, and what, what, what I'm trying to push at this point in my career is to say that no heart failure trial, uh, uh, you can have dual database log, there are multiple ways of statistically looking at it, but this question is becoming so important that the trials should not unblind till you achieve a specific number of cardiovascular death, not combined endpoint, so that these sort of questions are not left lingering. Okay, so I'll move on from uh, SGLT2 inhibitor to Varisiquat. So one question is, is worsening heart failure really a different disease or not? Uh, so I don't know whether it's a different disease or not. I cannot come up with any uh, pathophysiologic reason to say that when people come into the hospital, they are different patients. I think they are the, the same patients. So why did we do a Victoria trial uh, rather than in the outpatient setting, we mandated that people had recent hospitalization or IV diuretic use. And the reason for that is that uh, while I cannot prove to you that pathophysiologically hospitalization represent a different pathophysiology, but I can definitely prove to you with tons of data that uh, the prognosis after worsening heart failure is much worse. So you can again see we're falling into that trap of sicker patients that, 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 that we did in Emperor Reduced as well. Uh, so uh, we're talking about uh, 25 to 30% one year mortality risk in this patient. So this patient population is sort of really uh, uh, sick. So the reason to go uh, at this worsening patient population is not because it's a, a, a different pathophysiology, but it's a sicker uh, patient population. Uh, and indeed, uh, the inclusion criteria, if you look at it, uh, uh, targeted much uh, sicker uh, patients uh, uh, and the patient characteristics as opposed to uh, other contemporary trials, uh, much higher uh, uh, class three patients, much higher, almost double uh, NT-pro BNP, you know, and Emperor Reduce was about four or 500 micrograms higher here, talking about double uh, uh, NT-pro BNP. Uh, and, and more uh, low GFR. So, so clearly a uh, higher risk population. So what did we see? Well, here's the results. So look at the one year result now. So DAPA, HF and Emperor, we were talking about, look, it's 15% versus 20%. Here, you're talking about 37%. I mean, it's like way off the chart, one year event rate in this patient population. So, you know, uh, in as much as I sort of do trials and I, I, I love to look at the data, I have to say when I look, look at this result for the very first time, the, the, the results were unblinded to the investigators, I was kind of underwhelmed. And I was underwhelmed because, well, like 10% uh, relative risk reduction, really, you know, none of the, the trials uh, uh, that we uh, have seen, otherwise they are positive, are much more. Except that here is you where you fall into this trap of uh, absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction. So uh, let's take an example of, of uh, uh, amputation uh, in the CANVAS trial, right? So 
there was a doubling of the risk, really very, you know, you went from doubling of the risk, except that the absolute risk was so low that what you went with, when the amputation risk was increased in the cannabis trial with, with the canonical closing, you went from a risk of 0.03 per 100 person year follow up to 0.06 per 100 percent follow up year. In other words, that doubling of relative risk was associated with an unbelievably small absolute risk. Now, if you look at the reverse situation, uh, suppose if you have a, uh, a, a disease that kills 100 people in, in uh, some specified time frame, uh, and there's only a 10% relative risk reduction, you're reducing 10 deaths in that scenario, right? So there's a difference in absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction. And in this particular case, because this population was so high risk that while uh, the, the relative risk reduction is only 10%, the absolute risk reduction was 4.2%, uh, which is actually more than Paradigm HF uh, and comparable uh, to DAPA HF. So here is uh, the, the data sort of summarized across all four trials. I apologize, it's a busy uh, a, a, a slide. But if you can just focus on the middle that says annualized event rate. So part of the problem here is uh, that uh, these trials uh, have patients that are followed for uh, different durations. But if you look at the annualized event rate, uh, one can see that this patient population is at a much higher uh, uh, a risk, 37.8% uh, with Victoria. So if you then go down to the absolute risk reduction, uh, one can start seeing that uh, DAPA HF is 2.9. Victoria is 3.2 and Emperor Reduce is 4.8. Uh, however, I would caution us by saying that that doesn't mean that Emperor Reduce is the strongest, best drug and Victoria is the second best drug. Uh, again, these are different baseline risks that modulates absolute risk reduction. What I'm trying to emphasize is not to say which drug is better or not, is just to say that, that these things are much more complex than sometimes we tend to make just looking at the Kaplan-Meier curve. Where this thing gets even more complicated with Victoria uh, is that you actually had a comparable to Emperor or DAPA uh, benefit in the primary endpoint in the lower three uh, uh, tertiles, uh, quartiles of NT pro BNP. But if you look at the highest quartile, that's where things are actually going in the wrong direction. And if you look at the continuous analysis for GFR for BNP less than 8,000, uh, uh, you're actually getting a hardcore cardiovascular mortality benefit and over 8,000, uh, you sort of lose the benefit. So there sort of the question comes up is, uh, you know, these are not Rawls or Copernicus era. This is not 1998 where sick patients were just basically dying. These are patients with BNP of more than 8,000 on triple therapy, on RAS inhibitor, on beta blocker, on MRA. And the question is, uh, do you, are, are you too sick at a point? Uh, uh, where, where therapies don't work. So I think both in Emperor Reduced and in Victoria, we're learning these lessons uh, that either we need to do trials for longer or not enroll two sick patients in order to get the benefit. Another sort of inquisitive thing for me is that both with uh, Paradigm HF and DAPA HF, there was an interaction which was positive that less sick patients benefited and more sick patients benefited less, whereas we did not see that in Emperor Reduced. So the bottom line here is uh, that uh, I don't know whether I, I can make you sort of buy into this pathophysiologically, but from a risk perspective, I could say that uh, patients uh, with, uh, uh, you know, who don't have heart failure have sort of risk and then they develop heart failure and there's a really high risk for those patients. And then we give sort of our usual medical therapies and the risk comes down, but it really never comes down all the way to basic. And then they start developing worse than heart failure. And that's where our choices are uh, to either do something so that they go back into the residual risk categories, because if we don't, then they will move into the advanced risk category. And, and that's what we, we need to, to avoid. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over this slide. We'll let the guidelines committee tell us. So that then brings us to what are some of the other trials which are out there? Well, so IV iron, we know that uh, uh, has been shown in three different trials now to make people walk uh, uh, more and feel better, but we did not have any mortality morbidity trials. So the first trial that came out with morbidity mortality was the AFFIRM trial. These are the highlight results. Uh, 
uh, and they will be presented at uh, AHA. So I don't know the detailed results. So this was IV iron in iron deficient patient with or without anemia, it doesn't matter whether you have anemia or not, uh, at the time of discharge from acute heart failure. This trial will lead to a lot of discussion. And the reason why this trial will lead to a lot of discussion is because what they are saying in their press release is that they pre-specified a COVID-based analysis. And the analysis was that uh, they will look at the COVID analysis, uh, uh, they will look at the primary endpoint in the entire trial, and then they will censor patients in different countries and different regions when first case of COVID uh, was diagnosed. Because we all know that with COVID, everything got messed up. People were not coming into the heart, uh, hospital, their epidemiology was changing. Uh, the, the IP delivery was changing, the endpoint ascertainment was changing. So it turns out, and again, I don't know the detail, but again, I'm reading the, the high level results, that the trial just narrowly missed the p-value, 0.0567, something like that, really borderline missed uh, its primary endpoint. But in a pre-specified COVID analysis, the trial is positive. So. Again, uh, uh, looking at the totality of results, I would say even in the absence of a COVID-19 adjusted analysis, even if it borderline missed the p-value and whatever that p-value turns out to be 0.06, uh, in the totality of evidence from previous uh, smaller trials, I would say that it's a positive trial. But in terms of the lessons learned is here, it, it is the opposite problem. And the opposite problem is the lessons not learned. And what I mean by that is, that trials like a firm or, or Omegaptor McCarble, which were ending when COVID started, it's easy for us to say, well, we will just do pre and post COVID analysis. The question is that I'm involved in about a hundred trials that are ongoing and they're in the middle of it. How are we ever gonna adjust for COVID analysis when we are gonna have multiple ups and down swings and pandemics and second waves and third waves and all that kind of stuff. And, and how will we adjust for that statistically or clinically? Uh, I think will be very interesting discussion ongoing as we sort of live through this, but, but watch out, uh, firm results are coming out. And then the last trial is the Galactic HF. Again, the investigators uh, uh, gave the high level results. This was with Omocaptor McCarbell, which is a cardiac contractil, uh, uh, increasing the cardiac contractility uh, uh, drug. Uh, and basically, uh, they said there was no reduction in mortality, and the primary endpoint was sort of borderline positive. So uh, uh, we will hear more at the AHA. Uh, I don't want to sound overtly uh, uh, pessimistic, but the way the, the uh, press release was, uh, was engineered, uh, doesn't look like uh, that there is much here. Uh, but on the other hand, it also puts us in a good position that, that a year ago we were saying that there are so many trials going on, we don't know what the future of heart failure is. Uh, but at this point, uh, with Victoria out, uh, with Omicaptor McCarbell out, with the firm out, and with uh, DAPA two trials out, at least for HEFREF, for the foreseeable future, we actually know what the trial is going to be like. So in the last, last two or three minutes, I just quickly want to talk a little bit about uh, implementation science. We have a lot of evidence, but the question is, what are we going to do with this evidence? I'm not going to harp again on the fact that there are plenty of opportunities uh, to improve care uh, and, and, and our, our patients uh, need to be treated maybe a little bit better than what we do in the, in the, in the uh, uh, clinical uh, setting. Uh, so uh, what do these things add? So mathematically speaking, we can say, well, uh, yet another new therapy uh, on top of the baseline therapy can have subtractive, redundant, partially additive, fully additive, or synergistic benefit on top of baseline therapy. Uh, and the best that we can say uh, is that uh, these are fully additive benefits, and I'll show you some data to uh, that point. Uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, academics get paid to be critical and, and when we get paid to be critical, uh, uh, that's where, where science is. Uh, the, the problem is that the clinical care uh, is a two front war, right? So one is evidence generation and one is evidence implementation. And when academics are trained to be critical, when, when they have to generate evidence, but when they bring the same hat of being critical when it comes to implementation, uh, 
uh, I think we start doing a disservice. And we go into so many of these academic distinctions of sequencing and what to start first and what to start second and what dose to up titrate first and whatnot. And we take weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months and years. I mean, it's, it's mind boggling again. I don't want to be flippant. Remember, you know, our, 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 our oath is first do no harm. So, so we have to abide by that oath. But if you just, and so, so, so I'm not at all saying not worry about side effects, right? But if you look at cancer doctors, they say, well, you know, cancer, you're going to die. So we're going to put you in the hospital and we're going to start you on these five medications. And a lot of bad things are going to happen to you. We'll prepare you for those bad things. You will have nausea, vomiting, uh, infection, no white count, and your hair is going to fall off, and we'll work through with you on all this. In heart failure, we're going to give you this dose. We'll see you in three months. And if you have any degree of orthostatic hypotension, we'll just stop there, and we'll wait for things to get worse. And then we, in epidemiology, say that heart failure has as bad a prognosis as cancer, right? So, so there's a little bit of a, a, a sort of a disconnect. So and these are the data that the DAPA-HF investigators uh, uh, presented last year to say, when did DAPA-HF, statistically speaking, turn positive in terms of the Kaplan-Meier curve dissociating? And the answer was day 28. What did we see in Emperor Reduce? Literally day 12. At day 12, the trial was positive. So this whole thing that, you know, let's just sort of see you in three months or whatnot, we really sort of accrue risk to our patients and these are the data uh, that uh, uh, some of our colleagues uh, published in Lancet, basically saying that not on top of placebo, but on top of very good therapy with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers that you're already getting, uh, if you were to uh, switch ACE inhibitor to RNA, start MRA, and start SGLT2 inhibitors, you're talking about 6.3 years of additional uh, uh, life. So, so I, I would say, uh, and, and again, this is completely sort of a non-scientific comment on my part, uh, that, that sequencing is really a historical construct, not a biologic construct. That's one thing. So it really doesn't make sense to whether to start this or that, one. Two, there is not a single therapy known in heart failure with one exception, where if a drug works, it's working depends on what you give at baseline. You know, a, a RNA with or without MRA work, uh, beta blocker with or without defibrillator work, SGLT2 inhibitor with or without MRA work. These are independent parallel pathways. So this sequencing thing really does not matter, in my opinion. Obviously, we all need to follow our local guidelines. And the only exception we have is Evaberdine and beta blocker interaction, but obviously those are not independent pathways. Those are overlapping. A, a, a pathway. So the higher the dose of beta blocker, the lower the heart rate, the less the benefit with uh, with evaporating. Then uh, I don't want to fall into the trap of Sophie's choice uh, of this RNA versus SGLT2 inhibitor. I mean, we really got to give both these drugs to our patients uh, 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 per se. Uh, uh, however, well, one benefit with SGLT2 inhibitor is that the five reasons that make this up titration difficult uh, heart rate, blood pressure, creatinine, uh, uh, potassium, and multiple visits and dose titration. None of those are issues with SGLT2 inhibitors. With DAPA or EMPA, it's one dose and you're done. Uh, uh, and, 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 and you're done and none of these are sort of uh, uh, considerations. And then the last thing that I would say is that the lowest dose, that's just the introduction of therapy, uh, has the most benefit. And then obviously going up on the dose, uh, accrues more benefit, but the most benefit is just starting therapy. Uh, the dose is obviously not an issue with the MRA and SGLT2 inhibitor. So my bias would be that if we can get our patients every week for the first three or four visits and just start four drugs, RNA, MRA, beta blocker, SGLT2 inhibitors at low doses and cover all pathways and then worry about the dose titration in the future, and I would probably prefer going up on beta blocker dose first uh, than RNA. Uh, that probably makes a lot of sense to me. The other difficult question is, what is the future of heart failure care? Because while this foundational therapy is easy, overall care is becoming much and more and more complicated uh, with all the new devices that are coming up, valvular therapies, Verisiguad, Omocaptive, IV iron, Evabradine, and maybe heart failure centers, and cardiology versus primary care. I mean, these are really difficult things for us to, to learn.
So I will now sort of turn to get, uh, take my last two minutes and talk a little bit of philosophy that I talked to you about. And that will sort of make you understand maybe some of the comments that I made. So these are sort of, you know, uh, a con uh, a dialectic and, 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 and I'll just sort of read them uh, what, what, uh, what Emmanuel Kant said. And it is that the measurement, so, you know, all of these things, mortality and hospitalization, these are the measurements that we are seeing, right? So the measurement shows us the appearance of real objects. So this is not reality. This is the appearance of reality. And this appearance looks to us the way it looks because of our power of perception. So the reality is really not reality. It is the way we perceive it because of our, our capability of perception. So we understand the objects through our concepts of it. Uh, and we must be careful not to let our concepts go beyond what we can actually experience because we don't know what we cannot experience. So we first need to understand knowledge and then we can understand objects because the objects will conform to our powers of cognition and not the other way around. So if we were to do sort of psychometric testing on all of us, it all sort of boils down to this. Half of us will be rationalist and half of us will be, will be empiricist. So I am a through and through rationalist. Uh, I gather that none of these clinical trials will ever answer every single question for the patient sitting right in front of me. So I'm very comfortable taking my a priori knowledge of pathophysiology for the trial and extrapolate to the patient sitting in front of me, whether it's a HEFREF patient uh, who is older than the one in the trial or who is in the hospital where the trial was done in the outpatient setting or whatnot. To me, as a person, as a human being, rationalization is very easy, uh, but I suffer from the risk of a slippery slope. And the slippery slope is where do you stop the rationalization? Uh, so yes, half ref, inpatient, outpatient, that kind of makes sense. But, but what about tomorrow if you say half ref should be extrapolated to half pet, right? So you have to draw the line somewhere in rationalization. The other half of our colleagues are empiricists and they can say, hey, rationalist, what you say makes sense, but please realize that you're just making this up because there is, well, where is the data? Because for empiricists, everything has to be data driven. And my sort of plea or bias to you would be uh, that, that probably we should be more rationalist and less empiricist. We should leave empiricism to science and data generation, but become rationalist when we write our guidelines and we treat our patients. Because when we have really strict rules and guidelines and we get all bogged down on, on trial design and, and uh, 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 what you call that, uh, but, well, our, our guideline writing process and one trial and two trial and p-value and this and that, we sort of miss the bigger picture uh, because remember, uh, we will never know, we will always know the harm we do by doing things, but we will never know the harm we will do by not doing things. And that balance, that two front war, that implementation part uh, is really important. So I really appreciate, uh, I'm right at the top of the hour. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, and, and I uh, uh, really uh, apologize that I had to change uh, the last time when I, I was supposed to talk. Uh, uh, and I hope some of these sort of uh, subjective comments uh, uh, were, were of, of, of help to you and give you some insight. Thank you. Thank you, Javid, for a fascinating journey through uh, a very complex uh, and evolving field. Um, it's, it is the top of the hour, so we're going to just get a couple of questions. Uh, first, I want to thank you for uh, making the time for this. It's a, it's a big day, as you know, and, and there's a lot going on, so we appreciate your time. Uh, and in addition, I'm thankful that you're uh, a self-declared rationalist, because it means you're actually willing to answer a couple of our questions uh, without simply saying we don't know. Uh, so I'm going to give a, a couple of what I think might be quicker questions that have come up in the chat. Uh, you can see them as well. Um, the, uh, the, um, we talked about CBD events. Um, I, I don't think it's, we have time for win ratio. So uh, one question, uh, SGLT, should they be considered as osmotic diuretics? So this gets in the mechanism of action. Could you give us a really, uh, a really quick uh, uh, take on, on, on what you think about that, uh, that issue, osmotic diuretics and mannitol? Uh, 
So, so they are definitely osmotic diuresis, uh, diuretics. As far as there is excess glucose in the urine, you will have osmotic diuresis, but SGLT2 inhibitor uh, coupled with sodium hydrogen exchange receptors as well. So they block sodium hydrogen exchange. So it's not only peeing related to osmotic diuresis, you actually have natriuresis as well. Thanks. Um, Vikas has a question, uh, and a lot of, I get this one as well, and I'm sure you do as, uh, also uh, from day to day. Patients on a moderate, uh, say, you know, between 1 and 50% of an ACE inhibitor, uh, previously couldn't titrate to a full dose, switched over to the uh, initial dose of uh, the ARNI. Uh, do you think that's better? Do you think that's worse? Um, any comments? Yeah, so I would say, uh, so here my rationalist goes, so clearly, uh, it's better because you need to, so there are five pathways and with ACE inhibitor, you only block the ANG2 pathway, but not the neprilysin pathway. So even at lower doses, covering both pathways makes more sense to me uh, per se. Uh, if your spending function limitation is blood pressure, then I would much rather go up on the dose of beta blocker rather than ARN. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm going to, uh, do you have anything else to say about myosin activators or are you simply going to direct people to the AHA meeting? So I don't know the, 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 the results. All I can say is that their top line results said combined endpoint was reduced by 8% and there was no mortality difference. So Yeah, hard to say without more data. Yeah. yeah. Um, two quick last questions I have and then we'll let everyone go, uh, Javid. The first is uh, BNP is being increasingly used as entry criteria into clinical trials. Uh, we've seen perhaps uh, some unintended consequences of that in, in, the, uh, in the Emperor trial. Perhaps it, it altered the relationship between hospitalization and mortality. Uh, do you think that in the current day and age that we still need uh, BNP to act as a gatekeeper for HEF-REF trials? Not HEF-PEF, uh, where we're worried about the diagnosis, but half ref trials? So I would say yes. So there are two ways to look at the world. One way is to uh, not use BNP, uh, but the other way is to look for BNP, but have the sponsors do the trial for a longer time frame. Remember, if you have a higher BNP and taking sicker patients is good, just don't stop the trial because you reached your uh, uh, number of events wait for mortality to accrue. And I think that's a better word to answer the question. Yes, and, and we saw that we saw that both with Paragon and, and with the upcoming uh, Galactic trial where they were powered for CV death before yes. they were stopped. That's a good point. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, the, the real, uh, I think what a lot of people are thinking, more rapid titration, uh, use of combination drugs. Uh, do you have any comments about simultaneous initiation of uh, what I call the big four or foundational therapy. Are there two that you would like to use together? Are there two that you would avoid using together on the same day? Uh, or do you always uh, recommend using one at a time? So I always recommend using one at a time only because if a person calls in with some side effect and you've started two, then you don't know which one is which. The issue is not starting two or three medicines at the same time. The issue is, is starting one by one in a closer proximity. So let's look at acute myocardial infarction, right? In 48 hours, we start them on aspirin, Plavix, statin, MRA, ACE inhibitor, right? And we start like five drugs in, in a very short time frame. Uh, because they're right in front of you and you can watch them and you can do it every 12 hours. You cannot do that as an outpatient. So I would not start two drugs at the same time, but maybe on the phone, maybe on a weekly visit, just try to get there in four, six weeks. Yeah, and perhaps a little uh, uh, backwards plug for uh, in-hospital initiation too. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much, Javid. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to listen to you speak. You're at the front lines and in, as well as uh, at the decision level for a lot of these uh, huge land, uh, landmark trials. We look forward to further data in the future as things evolve. Um, uh, really appreciate you making the time. Uh, and as well, uh, we appreciate uh, uh, all of you online. Uh, many of you hardliners are still on. Uh, we had an excellent attendance today and uh, everyone have a great day and take care. And we'll, uh, we'll, I'm sure the world will, the sun will come up tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.